This episode of The Biggest Table is brought to you in part by Wild Goose Coffee. Since 2008, Wild Goose has sought to build better communities through coffee. And for our listeners, Wild Goose is offering a special promotion of 20% off a one-time order using the code TABLE at checkout. To learn more and to order coffee, please visit wildgoosecoffee.com. In this episode, I speak with Richard Beck. We explore the themes of hospitality, hope, and enchantment in Christian practice. From embracing marginalized individuals with grace to recovering an enchanted faith in a skeptical age, the conversation delves into the significance of ordinary moments like sharing meals and cultivating a sense of wonder and community. Enjoy the episode. Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Biggest Table. I am your host, Andrew Camp. And in this podcast, we explore the table, food, eating, and hospitality as an arena for experiencing God's love and our love for one another. And today, I'm thrilled to be joined by Richard Beck. Richard is an author and professor of psychology at Abilene Christian University. Richard, Richard's latest book is Hunting Magic Eels, Recovering an Enchanted Faith in a Skeptical Age. As a prison chaplain, Richard leads a weekly Bible study for inmates at the Maximum Security French Robertson Unit and has written and, expo- and spoken extensively about his work among the incarcerated. So thanks for joining me, Richard. It's great to reconnect. It's good to see you again. Excited for the conversation. Yeah. Um, so you have written a lot about hospitality, which is why, you know, I think your work here is important to this podcast. And so how personally, how did this become such a major theme for you? The beginning of it was the publication of my very first book back in 2011, a book called Unclean, uh, which is a lovely title. Uh, uh, and it's it's about the intersection, because I'm a psychologist, but it's about the intersection of uh, disgust and contamination psychology upon uh, Christian behavior and Christian practice. In many ways, it's a kind of a prolonged meditation of uh, the go- on the Gospels from a psychological advan- vantage point, where Jesus sat with and uh, was welcomed at tables and welcomed people to tables who were considered to be, you know, unclean uh, for um, either Levitical reasons like lepers, but a lot of them moral reasons, right? Uh, tax collectors and prostitutes, and. Uh, and Jesus kind of describes what he's doing there as mercy. Um, he, he points to the Old Testament prophet Hosea and says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, when he was defending his table practices. And I wanted to kind of explore that from a psychological perspective. And so I wrote the book Unclean to kind of get at the psychological uh, dynamics of the push and pull of hospitality, why it can be so difficult for us. Um, and then for me personally, after you write a book, People would ask me to speak about the book and then turn to personal stories. How have you, Richard, lived this out? And at the time, I didn't think I had a a very powerful or consistent witness. It's easy to write things, easy to say things. It's one thing to live it out. Mm -hmm. So I went through a very intentional season of my life where um, I moved my social location. And that's one of the reasons why I ended up out at the prison. But I also started uh, spending time at a little mission church here in my town where we um, share a meal on Wednesday nights with kind of the the poor and the economically marginalized in our community. And so those are the two places where I've spent most of my time um, sitting at tables with people very different from myself. No, right. And yeah, your work on clean is where I first learned about you and uh, began to understand this hospitality, um, you know, and in it... you describe hospitality as, um, and I'm going to summarize, and so correct me if I'm wrong, but sort of the will to embrace before any prior judgments are made. So can you explain what that means for our listeners? Yes, that actually comes from the theologian Miroslav Volf in his book uh, entitled Exclusion and Embrace. And so he talks about a will to purity. Um, That's that kind of quarantining approach where we try to create um, a, uh, a table of the safe and the same and the similar and the morally pure versus a will to, will to embrace. And Wolf describes the will to embrace as this kind of embrace and recognition of a person's humanity and their dignity prior to any other sort of moral or social judgments that we might make. Um, because if those judgments get out in front of the will to embrace, if we start seeing people as a class 
um, as like those tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes and lepers of, of whatever generation, then a process of dehumanization begins taking place. Um, and so Volf argues that we have to get the will to embrace out in front of those so those moral and social categorizations. Um, and so hospitality, as I describe it in a, in a later book called Stranger God, is, is primarily this affectional capacity to, to welcome people into our hearts, mm-hmm. um, especially when they might be um, different or triggering for us. Right. Because you say in Stranger God that hospitality doesn't begin at the table, but is an inward journey, um, you know, and other places you write that that first step is usually difficult. So and you sort of touched on it, but what, what is it about hospitality that's this inward journey that is actually so difficult to take? Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's a both in. I think we can practice our way into this affectional capacity. So sometimes, like I described in my own story, that will to embrace that those affectional capacities are cultivated by sitting at tables where we might feel initially uncomfortable are welcoming people to tables where we might feel uncomfortable. And and so there are practices that can take place first before the factual capacities. But but my my point about making that statement stranger god is that um un- until we deal with that will to embrace that that people will self sort and self segregate um um uh, some some theologians call it the social logic of homogeneity or like is attracted to like and if we don't do something to uh, intentionally face those affectional uh, uh, ruts that that we have, then the, then the the command for hospitality just kind of bounces off of us. So um, so I'm trying to kind of drive us into that psychological space where I am feeling uncomfortable or anxious or triggered by somebody, and realizing that it's at it's in that arena of my emotions um the the realm of a social psycho that a social psychologist would pay attention to that that's where that real battle is being fought unless we win that battle then we find ourselves at very different tables uh, but people just kind of look just like me no for sure and so then what are those obstacles and you um that we face those and you know because you've written about disgust contamination um you know in in those books and so what are those obstacles then we face when we're trying to get beyond the homogeneity of a table? Well, there, I mean, a lot. Um, so I, I, I would say, you know, the ones I focus on on unclean um, are the kind of the, the more, the moralization obstacles. Uh, we, we tend to, to reason about morality in the idiom of, of, of purity and uncleanliness. And since, Christians tend to see the world through very moralized lenses. Um, we, you know, whether we want to or not, kind of activate those purity impulses. And that's kind of what the Pharisees are doing in the Gospels. In, in their will to purity, as Wolf describes, the, the logic of purity is a quarantining logic, as we've learned from COVID, right? It's a social distancing. Mm-hmm. And the idea there is that the, the, the moral contamination of, of some group doesn't make contact with the pure. And, uh, and we could talk a lot about that, but what, when I talk about unclean with a lot of churches, they, they, some people don't feel on the hook because they're like, you know, I don't really feel disgusted or that I'm risking some sort of moral contamination there. Uh, so some of the other things I talk about are feelings of like, uh, moral superiority, Hmm. feelings of superiority, uh, and contempt, um, are very closely, associated psychologically speaking with the emotional disgust and a lot of people do feel on the hook when we're talking about contempt because that's like the emotion of our politics right now and it's the emotion of social media where we're and so it's not that we're revolted by people as much as we feel contemptuous of others so so there is disgust there is contempt some of it's fear Um, and i think a lot of the fear of the other um, is kind of motivated by um, a felt sense of scarcity. Now that that felt sense of scarcity can be uh, real um, or delusional. Um, so, for example, if you think about immigration and hospitalities at borders, right? One of the anxieties about 
immigration or borders is a felt sense of scarcity, that there's not enough uh, jobs, there's not enough money, uh, the government doesn't have enough resources to take care of uh, her own citizens. And thus, if we let all these immigrants in, then there won't be enough. And so that felt sense of scarcity, again, that can be real or that can be delusional. Still, that scarcity creates anxiety and fear. So, so you want to have a wall up. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, so those are those are like three examples. So disgust or moral revulsion, contempt. And then fear generated by a sense of scarcity, real or imagined, or, or, or things that cause us to, to stay away from people. And then lastly, I just say the simple dynamics that we described earlier about anxiety about difference. I think that human psychology is kind of wired to have that kind of stranger danger or that stranger anxiety. I think that's normal and it's adaptive. It can make sense. You want to identify your tribe. And, and I think that's one of the kind of deeply ingrained things that we struggle with hospitality is that the human mind. It's kind of default moral software is very tribal. It's very, mm -hmm. it's very insular. And, and it wants to make a distinction between my people and my tribe and others. I mean, if you even think about the word kindness, at the root of the word kindness is kin, mm. right? Yeah. Uh, I'm kind to the same kind of people as myself. So even the word kindness has a tribal border to it. Um, and so asking people to quote unquote, be kind to mm. everybody is swimming against the tide of some pretty stubborn psychological tendencies. And, and that's what we see in acts of, you know, this idea of how do, how does the Jewish church, the beginning church embrace others. And, you know, and it's when Peter has this dream of food and unclean animals and God tells him to eat it, that he has to wrestle with this idea of embracing and moving past the moral boundaries he's been raised with and has lived his whole life with. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah. it's been, yeah, it's been a battle since the beginning of the church, it seems. Yeah. I mean, in, in many ways, that event in Acts 10 is uh, like the seismic event in the church where, where, where her insular looking just inward, staying in Jerusalem, still ethnically bound, um, uh, Jews talking to Jews, but that turn outward to the world, to the nations and mm -hmm. to the ethnoses, right? To, to the Gentiles is huge. And it kicks off big problems in the book of Acts. What, what Peter does that day in, in visiting Cornelius and baptizing them, where, where that boundary, that kind of contamination boundary between the clean and the, and the, and the unclean pagans uh, is broken down. And that kicks off a huge issue. And, and here's the thing is you also see that continuing all through Paul's epistles, Right. That fundamentally, all you can make a, a decent argument to say much of Paul's epistles are about hospitality. He mm -hmm. is trying to keep these very different ethnic, these churches filled with these very different ethnic people. Look at a book like Galatians um, from fracturing along ethnic lines uh, into Jew and Gentile churches. And, and, and he's fighting to keep them at the same table constantly. Um, and so there's something about welcoming difference to tables that for Paul, at least is central to the kingdom of God. Right. No. And that's such a good reminder. Cause I think we look at the culture today and we think this is just a new problem or, you know, that, um, and so what, as we're living in a very fractured or dichotomized society, then what, and even within our own churches, it feels m more and more polarizing. Like what do we begin to do to, to combat this. Oh my goodness, boy, if we could solve that on this podcast, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, no, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, to me, I think one of the things that ha has to happen is, um, that I, I think, uh, as we've increasingly descended into like a post-Christian context that, that politics has increasingly become like the repository of my values and my identity. And, and because of that, um, we're seeing where politics should be a pragmatic discussion about how to, you know, balance competing goods, hmm. you know, like if you go back to the vaccine debates, you know, um, you know, it was, it was a health crisis and 
um, and you need collective action to deal with a public health crisis. And so a push to get everybody vaccinated, that makes sense. And, and that's a good thing, right? Um, mm -hmm. But then, but then you also on the other side, people saying like, I should have bodily autonomy and somebody should make me put something in my body, especially not the state to put something in body that I want to. And that's a good too. So how do you balance that? Like, like, how do you balance bodily autonomy, individual choice in the face of a pandemic where we need collective action to get kind of herd immunity and, and get in front of the curve of the contagion? Well, you know, that should have been a pragmatic conversation, but like, how do we solve that dilemma? Instead, what happens is we demonize both sides of that argument. So instead mm -hmm. of saying two goods that we're trying to balance, we're demonizing the good. And the reason why we're demonizing the good is because I think we've overly moralized our politics. We don't see it as pragmatic solution solving. We see it as, so in one sense, I would say that politics has become too existentially important for a lot of us. It's become an identity marker. It's become the repository of our values. And, and consequently, I think that leads to polarization um, because if you disagree with my politics, then you're evil. You know, yeah. you're not just on the other side of a, of a, of a weighted good, you are just rather evil. And so I do think, and I know that's not really a conversation about hospitality, I, I, but I do think that it's some deeper soul work that needs to take place in the church where we can kind of um, lower the temperature maybe on politics and kind of right. recover some of the values of the kingdom. Um, and, and, and so what would be the metric of that? Like, how, how do you know you're making progress on that? Well, I mean, do you argue to come back to hospitality or are you developing friendships across political boundaries? Hmm. So how many, if you're a Democrat, how many Republican friends do you know? And how many of them are welcome at your table? And if you are a Republican, how many Democrat friends do you have? And are you working with those tables? And if you're not practicing hospitality across those political divides, then, then you get those polarized echo chambers that we're seeing. And to be clear, that takes a lot of work. Um, yeah. and, and it takes a lot of effort. Um, but I do think churches are places where that can happen. Um, because increasingly, um, churches, um, uh, at least my church is one of the few places where, uh, political differences actually being encountered face to face mm -hmm. in shared ministry and in shared tables. Now, to be clear, there are very, very conservative, very, very liberal churches where they're pretty homogeneous. But my church is pretty purple, and I think a lot of people are go to church with people that are across the spectrum. And I think it's those it's in those spaces where we come together. And yeah, maybe it's just hospitality over bad coffee and donuts in a Bible class. But we are have we are as a little diverse group going to go through this election year together. Yeah. And these are good places where we can learn to practice uh, kingdom habits of welcome. Um, instead of defaulting into kind of a culture war fight. Um, and the reason is because hospitality humanizes yeah. people. We, we are dealing with a human person. And that's why often if we are in conflicts with people, the very first thing we should do is eat with them. It is much harder to hate somebody or demonize them if you've broken bread with them. And, and, and in many ways, I think that's kind of the genius of the whole idea of the Lord's Supper, because back in that Middle Eastern context, if you break bread with somebody, right, if you extend hospitality, that was like a declaration of peace. Like right. if, if you if you have broken bread with them, you cannot like hurt them or kill them. And so there's something about sharing a meal as kind of a, a covenant of peace that I think is a really powerful idea, especially in a very divided and polarized um, nation like ours. I love what you're saying is that, you know, the demonizing of people and versus seeing them as or even receiving them as Jesus, you know, cause you, what I love about your discussion on Matthew 25, when Jesus says, you know, when I was hungry, you clothed, when you fed me. And when you, when I was naked, you clothed me. And when I was in prison, you came and visited me. It's not so much that we're a lot of times that Matthew 25 passage is talked about. We're bringing Jesus to those places. But I think your emphasis is that we're actually receiving Jesus in, in those places, uh, which I, yeah. Yeah. No, go ahead. Well, I was going to say that's that's kind of where um, 
the hospitality conversation has got so much traction, I think, in this last generation, um, because there's a lot of words that Christians have used about kind of, you know, being a good person. You know, we have words like evangelism. We have words like mission, like missionary, mission trip. Um, we we have words like benevolence and charity and love and service. And so the question is, like, what is the word hospitality doing differently? Or is this just another word for, you know, being nice? But as you point out in Matthew 25, hospitality is unique in all those words because it flips the script on, like, where Christ is located. And, and words like benevolence, charity, uh, you know, mission, service. Well, we are always the agent of Christ in this scenario, bringing Christ to the world. As, you know, we say in our churches, you know, we are the hands and the feet of Jesus. So we're always Jesus in these stories. We're always the hero, the Messiah in that mm -hmm. sense. But hospitality flips it and suggests that maybe Christ is in the other. And so hospitality is an encounter with Christ in difference or, or in the other um, in a way that kind of surprises us um, because in Matthew 25, uh, Christ is the homeless person. Christ is the naked person. So in the practice of hospitality across margin, you know, across the, the boundaries of society, in many ways, I am being saved instead of mm -hmm. saving others. I am being saved. Um, and so, you know, it flips it to say, for example, um, in, I can see my ministry out at the prison as me trying to save, you know, these criminals. But the other way to think about it is those criminals are saving me hmm. and, the, and the incarcerated might be able to save the church. How, how might hospitality to the homeless? Yeah, save the homeless. But how, how might relationships and friendships on the margins um, show us how the homeless might save the church? Um, and, and I think that's just a different imagination. Right. So how have the homeless or how have the incarcerated saved you, Richard? Like where, how has this impacted your soul and your journey? Oh goodness. In so many ways. And so I, I, you know, I'll, for, for any listeners that know my work, you know, I, I, you know, my books are sprinkled with stories of this, but here's one story. Um, the way the incarcerated saved me is when I went, when I went out to the prison, I was in a season of deconstruction and I don't know, you know, how many of your listeners know that word, but deconstruction is just that kind of questioning and tearing down everything in my faith. Um, right. Really leaning into doubt and, and, um, and, uh, to the point where I'll, I'll have considered myself, you know, at that season, more like a Christian agnostic. Hmm. And, and by that, I mean, I was still kind of practicing, you know, still practicing Christian, still going to church, you know, um, uh, praying and things like that. But, but if you ask me, like, is any of it true? I'd be like, I don't know. You know, I mean, I, I think this is a good, I think Christianity has a lot of good practices. Like I like the practice of being kind and the, you know, um, I still got a lot of value out of going to church, but if you push me on it all from a belief perspective, I'd go like, I don't really know. Anyway. Um, and so I, when I went out to the prison, um, very early on, I was I was trying to think about what to do for the content of the study. And I thought, you know what I'll do? I'll do the lament psalms because that's where I was. I was kind of an angsty, doubting, you know, lament psalm kind of guy. And I was like, well, you know, prisons are very dark and, you know, God forsaken places. The guys out at the unit will they'll resonate with this message of where is God in the mm -hmm. suffering of the world, in the injustice of the world. So I so I started the study and I was I vividly remember this. I was going through the lament Psalms, you know, the God forsakenness, where's God, what, you know, why is there injustice and so on and so forth. And, and they stopped me. They just outright stopped me. And they're like, listen, like, what are you doing? And, and I was like, well, you know, I'm talking about the lament Psalms. And they're like, listen, like we get it. Prison's depressing. Like, we don't need you to come in here and tell us how horrible our lives are. And I was like, oh, that's a good point. I guess you're right <laughs> about that. I said, so what do you, what do you need? And they go, well, we need hope. Hmm. And I said, well, I don't really do hope. Like, I haven't been hopeful. <laughs> yeah. I 
you know, for quite quite some time, you know. Right. I've, I've been I've been I've been deconstructing. I've been hopeful. But they said we need hope. And I said, "Okay. All right. Well, I'll I'll, I'll do hope." Hmm. And so, you know, I started, you know, turning in texts and preaching sermons about hope out there. And and that um and that that practicing hope like pulled me out of kind of the spiritual funk I was in and, and, and turned me into a season of like reconstruction uh, in my life. And so in many ways I was saved by my faith was saved by um, uh, these, these incarcerated men um, and them asking me and walking alongside me as I was, I've been their Bible teacher, you know, they have nudged me towards faith in ways that I wasn't getting at my church on the outside. Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah, you you journeyed in hope together through mm-hmm. just having discussions. Yeah. Uh, wow. Uh, and then in your newest book, like just to transition a little, like you're you're talking, you know, it's called um, "Hunting Magic Eels," and you're talking about recovering enchantment, which I think plays into this I- maybe idea of hope and rediscovering what faith can look like. So what? what's behind this, this book and how does it fit within what you've spoken about hospitality maybe? Yeah. Well, um, I, I probably should explain the title because everybody <laughs> thinks it's a book about cryptozoology, you know, like, <laughs> like Bigfoot and the Loch Ness monster, the Chupacabra, right. you know, and hunting magic eels. But the story, the story that frames the title of the book was my wife and I were in Wales on San Juan Island um, which was the island where a famous Celtic Saint Dwynwen uh, had an abbey. Hmm. And she is the Saint Valentine's of the Welsh people. And she became the patron saint of love because on this island, there was a water well that had these eels in it, these magical eels. You know, and the idea was that if you threw a token of your true love into the well and the eels disturbed that token, um, that was a sign your lover would be faithful through life. And so all these lovers uh, made these pilgrimages out to this well um, to, you know, discern if, if their lover would be faithful. So she became the Val- St. Valentine's of the Welsh people. And Jan and I were out there looking around that island, you know, looking for the water well and, you know, enjoying the legend. And um, but then I go on to make the point that um, that's not our world anymore. Like it's an enchanting story, but people don't seek premarital counseling through magical eels anymore. Yeah. And and so it's about kind of that shift from what uh, sociologists have described as like an enchanted world where the supernatural is abundantly obvious to um, our world, which is described as disenchanted, um, where uh, we're losing people in the church. Rates of atheism, agnosticism are on the rise. Uh, the the religiously unaffiliated, the nuns, right? No re- religious affiliation. Th- those people are on the rise as well. Mm-hmm. So what's ha- you know what's happened? It's a book about like what has happened to, to bring this disenchantment about, and how might we recover our enchantment? Um, so it's basically kind of bringing the 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 God and the supernatural kind of back into view for maybe some skeptical old people, which is where I was. So so in many ways, the book it, it is was the product of my ministry out among the incarcerated and among the poor. Uh, at that little mission church where I broke bread because um, they were the ones that kind of put God back on my radar screen. Mm-hmm. Um, th- their faith in- inspired me in many ways. And and so the, this book is like the culmination of that journey of like uh, reconstruction uh, for me. So in one sense, it's just the, the, the gift I was given mm-hmm. um, through being welcomed by others. Um, but I, the, but a, a more direct connection between the content of like Honey Magic Gills and Stranger God um, is that idea. So let's go back to the, the, in the Gospel of Luke, the road to Emmaus, mm-hmm. where in the act, right? So the two followers yep. of Jesus are walking down the road and Jesus shows up as a stranger. And it's a very, you know, murky kind of, I mean, that's kind of a weird thing that why couldn't they recognize him, but they don't recognize him. 
And then as they reach town and the sun is setting, they show hospitality to this stranger to stay the night. And then it's in the breaking of the bread that the risen Christ is recognized. And, and so one way to think about the connection there between hospitality and enchantment is, you know, or the, the, the line from Hebrews, like, do not forget to practice hospitality because some of us have entertained angels unaware. And so in many ways, through these practices of hospitality, um, we, we do have an encounter. We do have sacred moments. Uh, miracles occur. We, we, mm. you know, right, we, we see the enchantment there. Um, and, uh, and, and I, I, I bet, um, a lot of your listeners who are and people joining this podcast would, would say some of the most enchanting evenings of their life or the most enchanting, meaningful moments of their life occurred in acts of breaking bread with people. Mm -hmm. Um, where after a meal, you just look back. I mean, my wife and I do that, even our marriage, right? The holy grounds are, we will go back and remember meals that we had um, right. when we were just dating or, and, and it's what's funny. Like, so we have this one amazing memory where um, we got to go to Hawaii because there was a conference there and we would have never gone otherwise. We didn't have any money, but I got to go because my school paid for it. She came along and we talked about, we had an anniversary around that time. And so we had this meal, like it was on the beach and it was a sunset. It was, we talk about that meal all the time, but we also talk about this meal when I was a young professor and we had like no money. And Janet called me up after work and she said, I have, um, I have a dollar. <laughs> Would you go with me to Wendy's and we can share a frosty? And so we went to Wendy's, we had like a dollar, we bought a Frosty, we had got two spoons and we ate this Frosty together. And that Frosty is as enchanted for us as a meal on the beach in Honolulu. Hmm. You know, is there something about meals like that, that do that? Right. And they, so they don't have to be, cause that's the, that's the thing I put on people's radar screen is these meals don't have to be, um, the like the wine and the extravagant and the five course meals they could be they can be sharing a frosty because you have no money or like i am with my friends on wednesday night like the food that gets shared in in food kitchens and soup kitchens is not typically food that most foodies will eat right, right? it's processed cheese it's it's there's no culinary amazement there and yet just sharing a bologna sandwich you know with somebody who's very different from you in folding chairs um, have been some of the most profound experiences in my, in my life. And so um, all that to say is, you know, um, sit down at a table over frosty or bologna sandwich or over a five course meal with a lovely bottle of wine and let the magic happen. Mm -hmm. No, it is. It's true. Yeah. I, I love fine dining, but I also realize the enchantment can happen anywhere at any point. And it usually surprises us, right? You know, like you wouldn't think that going to, to Wendy's with your wife and having a frosty would be a lasting memory for you, but mm -hmm. something happened there and it, it's a surprise, um, not something you can manufacture. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do we be open then to en enchantment? Because it's not something we we can always manufacture, but it is something we can have a posture and a readiness for, it would seem. Yeah. I mean, so William James, a um, uh, famous philosopher and psychologist, wrote a book called The Varieties of Religious Experience. It's famous. He wrote, wrote around like 19, early, you know, the early 1900s, 1902, I think. And he talks about the marks of a mystical experience, uh, an encounter with transcendence or bumping into God. You know, and one of his his marks of the mystical experience is passivity. And by that, he means um, they happen to us. We receive them. Um, I like the word we're interrupted. Hmm. Um, we're interrupted by the sacred. And, and so you're right. The, um, much to the frustration of every worship pastor ever, like you cannot make it happen. They try, <laughs> you know, they're trying up there on the stage to just, ma just make everybody feel all the feels. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why worship music and praise stuff can get so emotionally overwrought mm -hmm. is because they're trying so hard to make it happen for everybody, but you can't, um, it, it, um, 
and you can try too hard and, and you know, there's ways we can put a great meal together and it, it doesn't kind of happen. And so, so to your point, since we can't make it happen, what, what can we do? So I think you're, I think some of it is, uh, so there was a, there was a student, I teach an adjunct class over at Fuller Theological Seminary. And, um, and I was talking about enchantment and one of my students, Tony Trebek was a pastor out in California. And he talked about how he'd lived out there for some many years um, and uh, really enjoyed spotting whales out in the Pacific. Um, but, but the curiosity was his wife had been out there the same amount of time and she'd never seen a whale. Hmm. So he kind of uses this idea of enchantment being whale, whale spotting. And his point is like, how do you spot a whale? Well, you got to go to the beach, right? First. So that's the, that's the intentional part, right? You can, you can put yourself at the beach, right? right? You can, you can, Put yourself at tables um, uh, and you can keep doing that even if you go there and nothing happens, but you can keep the posture that can become a habit of behavior. And then when you're there, you have to not be at the beach and reading a book. You have to, you know, or closing your eyes as you sunbathe, you have to be gazing out over the ocean. And if you do that, right, if you go through these practices, you will see whales. So I do think we, we have to um, have intention and then practices that kind of make us available for these divine interruptions. Um, and that's important because when I tell stories of the prison, I was talking about this just, just this week with my co co teacher out at the prison, um, that, uh, that a lot of these ministries are, are, are disciplines of fidelity because I can, like I told you that really beautiful story about preaching hope that, that first night. And I can tell you beautiful stories about eating at Freedom Fellowship. And then, and then people will want to come along. Mm -hmm. Hey, I've heard your stories. I'm inspired. Can I come out to the prison? And I'm like, sure. And, or can they'll go to Freedom Fellowship and they're going to, they're going to think that some amazing thing is going to happen. And, it, and, and nothing often does happen. You know, it, right. it, and, and mostly it's just awkward because you're new and you don't know any of these people. And so, um, and I th do think this is one of the problems in, in Christian podcasting and Christian uh, writing and in Christian preaching is the, the telling of the amazing story. Hmm. Like, 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 like you got to tell an amazing story to be a great author, you know, and you talk about all these stories. And I've been, I do that in my books. I tell you the best stories out of the prison. Or I tell you the best stories at Freedom Fellowship. And, um, but then people show up in those spaces. And they're like, I don't see it. Like, this is kind of lame or boring or weird. And, um, and so that's why I try to tell people, like, if you want to come, don't come expecting magic. Like, the, you got to keep coming. That's the, that's the trick. You got to keep showing up at that table and over time, right? Yeah. You go to the beach and keep looking for whales and then God interrupts you. And so I do think a lot of people want like quick fixes. Like I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do this practice of hospitality. I'm going to have these people over and some sort of amazing thing is going to happen because I've listened to Andrew's podcast, <laughs> you know, and, right. and it was just exhausting and no, no fireworks. But if you keep showing up, um, mm -hmm. and I think that's why it says in Hebrews, do not, right. Do not forget to practice hospitality, right. It's, it's, it's a continual practice, you know, so don't forget it, keep doing it. And then God will show up. And so I think some of this stuff is about fidelity hmm. to the practice and not necessarily trying to conjure up an amazing experience. Um, and, uh, a perfect table and the, and something fireworks will happen. Um, so those are just some thoughts. Yeah, no, those are great. And as you're talking about fidelity, I'm just thinking, you know, as a father of young girls, as we're, we try to have dinner around the table, we try to be faithful for that. And there are times where it's a frustrating experience because, you know, a five and a seven year old, they're dealing yeah. with, everything right but there are then moments where it we are disrupted by god's presence and we are reminded of the joy um you know like for instance we were 
having a cheese and wine night, you know, at our house on Monday night. And we gave the girls, you know, not the cheese we were eating just because, you know, their palates don't like it yet. Right. But they made their own cheese and meat platters. And at one point, Hazel, our seven-year-old says, daddy, you got to try this. Like, it is so good, but you have to have two Ritz crackers. And, you know, it's just, and she does the like, you know, kiss on the lips, you know, the Magnifico type thing, you know, and just to see that joy, you know, you're just like, okay, this is why we as a family sit down every night, you know, and, and cause in that connection moment, she's experiencing something that she loves and will hopefully resonate with her throughout her life. Yeah. No, I think you're right. I think, I think that's probably the best way to think about p- Christian practices. Like Christian practices are not um, moral exertions. We're not like doing these things to become better people. Uh, neither are we trying to like climb some spiritual maturity ladder. We practice these, this, these things to make us available to divine interruptions. And so that night, right? Yeah. You're interrupted and you go like, that's, but if I don't do that practice, I never get those moments. No, no. Or if I get fed, fed up because one night is rough and I do get fed up, right? Like, you know, but to stay with it, you know, and, and to hope and to say that, you know, no, this is important. This is who we are as a family, you know, mm-hmm. hopefully it pays off down the road. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, thank you. No, these are this is a great conversation, you know, and as we think about beginning to wrap up, there's a question I, I love asking people and you've hinted at it and, but, um, to sort of summarize, as you think about the church today, what, what's the story you want the church to be telling, you know, to our world or to its culture? Wow. I mean, there are a lot of things, you yeah. know, um, there's a lot of things. You know, I was talking, I'll, I'll just say something that was just on my mind because it's something I talked about with some of my students yesterday. You know, we were in class and and I was talking about faith and um, and I said, you know, one of the distinctive things about the, the ministry of Jesus, a lot of scholars will point to this and say that the distinctive thing about the message of Jesus and the distinctive aspect of the Christian faith is this idea of grace. Um, you don't see that really emphasized much in, in the Old Testament. You don't see it emphasized over much in Eastern religions, whether you're kind of locked in kind of to a kind of a karma cycle. You don't see a lot of it in Islam or even in paganism, right? But this idea of grace is a distinctly Christian idea that that um, you're not going to get what you deserve, that there's, you're going to get something um, better, you know, Mm. something you don't deserve. And I kind of wish the church would become like the prophets of this, you know, that that we would be the people that would be distinguished by grace and graciousness. and I think that connects with hospitality because I think hosp- I think uh, acts of hospitality are the incarnations of grace, right? Mm-hmm. It is it is a you're welcome here, you know. Um, I see you um, that will to embrace, mm-hmm. you know. Because so so grace doesn't just become this like I love everybody. It's not, it's not aspirational. It's not vague. It's concrete and practicing. And so to me, that would be what I wish the church, like we would get back to what the central, what I think is the central message of the Christian religion, which is a message of forgiveness and mercy and grace. Um, and that's what we will be known for, you know, mm-hmm. that we wouldn't be known for hostility or anger or, um, or just anxiety. We just look like a very anxious kind of group of people. Um, but non-anxious people filled with grace, um, Hmm. I think would be, I mean, how attractive is that? I think it's just a compelling message. And I I just am dismayed and perplexed why Christians aren't better at proclaiming their own faith uh, in many ways. Like, because the Christianity I see online and in the world 
to me just seems kind of unrecognizable to me in many ways because it's so ungracious. Um, so that's what I would say. Grace. Yeah. No, that's a great word, you know, and it's that reaching out to touch before cleansing, you know, or, um, not asking people to clean up before we extend grace, but the extension of grace first. Mm -hmm. Uh, No, thank you for that word. Um, and then as we wrap up a few fun questions, just that are fun questions, fun questions, you know, um, since it's a, it's, it's about food and stuff. And so, sure. So what's one food you refuse to eat? Well, I mean, this is going to be horrible. I'm going to say horrible things on this, on this podcast, because, you know, there's probably a lot of foodies listening, you know? And so I just would like to say I've been brought on as a psychologist and a theologian and yep. not as a culinary expert, no, but enough. I've, I've, I've never liked tomatoes. I don't like, I'm not a tomato person, which kind okay. of rules out a lot of dishes, yeah. you know? So like Italian food is just not something you do. Well, no, I love Italian food. I don't mind. Okay. Um, so I don't like tomatoes, like eating a sliced tomato. Let me just say okay. that. Sliced tomatoes. Okay. But, but, but when, when tomatoes are used in like dishes, I don't, I don't necessarily mind that. If there, okay. if there's chunks of tomatoes in it, I don't like it. Um, and that goes all the way back to childhood, back to kind of discuss psychology. You know, a lot of these, you know, my book on clean, um, you know, a lot of these food preferences kind of get kind of locked in at a young age. And then it, it, you have to be real back to practices, real intentional to kind of uh, uh, unlearn some of these. And some parents will notice this where their kids' food preferences, um, they used to eat a lot of stuff. And then there's that season, you know, where they um, they get real narrow. Right. Um, and I think mine locked in. On, I don't know why, but the tomato locked in and I've never been able to practice my way out of it. Hmm. Maybe if I toured Italy, right. that would be like, I should do that as a spiritual discipline. I will yeah. tour Italy and learn to like tomatoes. Yes. And now that you, you and your wife are empty nesters, take her on a, a tour of Italy and eat really yeah, good, yeah. fine ripened tomatoes. And I, I exactly. was similar for a little while where I couldn't eat a tomato, um, just especially a cherry tomato because of the explosion. Um, yeah. And I, I do think there's something about that. Cause a lot of people say they're, you know, you're in the food world, right? They're, they're like texture issues. It's right. not really, there's something about the softness or something or the explosion you felt. So sometimes it's not even the, the taste it's, no. it's the, it's the, the mouthfeel, I guess that right. throws somebody off. Yep. No, for sure. No, I've had some interesting responses where I'm like, wow, like somebody, what guest once said they don't like mushrooms. And I'm like, how? How do you not like mushrooms? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Again, it's, it's, it's every, yeah, those food preferences are, are real. So then on the other end of the spectrum, what's the best thing you've ever eaten? The, the best thing I've ever eaten? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, that, that's an, uh, that's an interesting, I mean, I can think of some of the, best meals I've had. So I'm kind of, you know, I'm down here in, in, uh, West Texas. So like barbecue and steak houses are like a big deal. So I apologize for all my vegan and vegetarian friends, but typically down here, I've typically, you know, had like a, like an amazing steak. Right. Um, at, at some, like, so there's a restaurant here. Um, you know, what? so there's a restaurant here. Perini's ranch is like, like, it's the place people go. Like if you come to West Texas and people are like, I want a steak, where do you go? We go out, we drive about 30 minutes out of town to what's called Perini Steakhouse. You can look it up online. It's pretty famous. I think they've even served meals at the White House. Come on. Um, and so, uh, but man, they have these, what are called jalapeno poppers out there. Yeah. You got, so it's, it's cream cheese and, and um, a jalapeno wrapped in bacon with like a little sweet like drizzle on it. I don't know what the, mm. I don't know what the glaze is. So it's 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 spicy but savory because of the bacon and the cheese and has a little bit of a sweet on it. And I don't know, but man, bacon, jalapenos, and cheat cream cheese are like I don't know. That's, I just love that. 
No, I understand. No, it does sound delicious. So let, let me be the person to put jalapeno. Like, like, yeah. uh, have you ever had one of these? Out I've of had Texas, jalapeno pop, not not in Texas, no, but I, I know what you're talking about. And but if you go to a restaurant like in yeah. Texas that like where they, you know, these aren't things that buy a store, but like made by yeah. like a chef. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah. so this is kind of like Bobby Flay kind of stuff, right? It's the Southwestern. <laughs> right hot spice savory but a little mm -hmm. bit of a sweet like that's yeah. that's what i'm talking about that particular um southwest uh combination um is is out of this world no for sure and then finally there's um a conversation among chefs about last meals as in like if you knew you had one last meal to enjoy what would it be you know <laughs> so so if you knew you had one last meal left on earth what what would it be Okay, so this is this is um, a movie reference. What? So uh, what was that? I think it was called the menu, the one with the Ralph Fiennes. I think it's called the menu. Yeah, I haven't seen it, but no, yeah, I've. Okay, I'm just familiar with the conversation. So, well, well, so it's kind of a dark comedy, right? Or dark satire. I don't know how funny it is, but but it's a dark comedy on like food culture, and um and food criticism, um. But there's this moment in it, and this is oh, this is a bit of a, a this is a bit of a uh, spoiler war, war, warning, right? Where this the greatest chef ever, right, is displaying all of these techniques and explosions of taste at each course of the meal, and at one critical point in the movie, um, you discover that this chef was actually like uh, started off as like a teenager, like flipping burgers like that was his beginning in his right he was flipping yeah. burgers to become the greatest chef you know and um and and there is this moment in the movie where um and the kind, the kind of the point of the movie is the the aesthetics of the food have come to replace the food itself hmm. um right everybody's going to been caught up into the conversation about the food, but the, but the actual, and, 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 and a part of the subtle context is, is like how, if you go to these fine dining restaurants, like you can't actually be full. Like right. they give you like, it's all, so we're all just like tasting things, but nobody's like satisfied. Like nobody's satiated, like how to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, push back from the chair with a full belly, you know, like you don't get right. that feeling in fine dining restaurants. You're just, caught up in the i guess the culinary fireworks mm -hmm. um and also just the sampling of tastes but never eating mm -hmm. right never really yeah. eating um and so the the there's a moment in 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 the thing where at a climactic moment the um and a lot is hanging on the balance so i'm going to kind of vague about this where the um the the lead of the thing challenges the chef to make a cheeseburger hmm. and this is like the breakthrough moment like this this functionally saves her life hmm. because she's asked for like food like like a burger and so this world renowned chef you see him prepare this burger right you know going back to his days on the burger line and so I'm saying all I have to say that if I had one last meal, I would want an incredible burger with awesome. fries and a chocolate malt. Okay. Like that's my, that's my send off. I would love a cheeseburger with fries, like a good one. Yeah. Like the one prepared on the menu and everybody's seen okay. the movie. They'll know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Like the best burger you could think of juicy mm. melted cheese fries and a chocolate shake like that for since being a child has been like my favorite comfort food ever yeah. but no no slice of tomato on that burger for richard yeah but no slice of tomato yeah <laughs> <laughs> so so again i'll be your one guest that has put yeah. jalapeno poppers and my last meal is a cheeseburger no it's great it's awesome it's fun that's what's so fun to see and hear these questions as the differing yeah. aspects of what people how people associate with the question uh yeah, so. I'm a chocolate malt connoisseur. Okay. Like, like, you know, and there's a funny saying because my boys have heard their dad order whenever I could. Not because not every place has malts, you know, they no. do chocolate shakes. 
And, and so the joke in my family, it's still, this is legend in the Beck family is, is the boys ask me when they're like, dad, what's the difference between a chocolate shake and a chocolate malt? And my answer was deliciousness. <laughs> and so they, they still, we still talk about that. What's the yeah. difference between a chocolate shake and a chocolate malt? Answer deliciousness. Fair. No, I love it. <laughs> Well, Richard, I really appreciate um, you taking the time and um, it's always great to talk with you and hear your heart um, and just, yeah, your thought has really impacted me and, um, and not just your thought, but your life, you know, and how you, you actually live what you're, you're writing about, which you say is harder to do. Um, so no, I just appreciate it. Um, you have a blog. What's your blog where people might hear, see more of your ideas? <clears throat> So it, it exists in two virtual spaces. So okay. the original blog is on Blogspot. It's called Experimental Theology at Blogspot. But a lot of my people now are, are subscribing to it uh, through Substack. So okay. if you go to Substack and, and um, look up Experimental Theology, Richard Beck, you can get it in your inbox yep. um, every morning. So um, yeah, Experimental Theology, Richard Beck, you'll find it one of those two places. Awesome. Yeah. And his books are readily available wherever you buy your books and just really, really encourage you to read um, and interact with this thought, just um, especially in today's culture. Um, so again, thank you for listening. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing, leaving a review or sharing it with others. Thanks for joining us on this episode of The Biggest Table, where we explore what it means to be transformed by God's love around the table and through food. Until next time, bye. Awesome.